I felt as though I was lost in the system and I was never going to get out. I've been in four different adolescent units and two adult units with mental health problems, but I can say the same thing about all of them, and that is that I see them as places of containment and not environments that are conducive to recovery. Freya is not alone as significant failings emerge at inpatient units in the Children and Adolescent Mental Health Service. The mental health charity Mind spoke to more than 400 young people who'd gone to hospital in England for their mental health when they were under 18. Only 8% said they'd had a positive experience. Half felt they weren't treated with respect and only 9% said their views were listened to. Mind heard widespread accounts of patients put on inappropriate adult wards, being over-medicalised, receiving excessive use of restraint and being placed far away from home. Young people talked about a system that was failing. They talked about not having the care and the, the support that they needed. And they talked about often coming out with their mental health being in a worse place than it was when they first went in. So these things aren't isolated incidents. They are happening day in, day out, in our hospitals to our young people. And it's simply unacceptable. Freya is now diagnosed with complex PTSD, depression and anorexia. She's been in and out of hospital, having been sectioned several times since she was 15. These are her personal experiences. The worst bit for me was the overuse of restraint and force feeding and medication injected. In my opinion, if someone is showing distress, they should be spoken to, supported and de-escalated first but that didn't happen. It would jump straight to restraint, which often was not done with the correct techniques. So you'd leave with bruises all over your body and you were never really given a say into your treatment or supported before things got to that point. Freya has been waiting for an autism assessment for five years. She wonders if life might have been very different if waiting lists had been shorter and she'd received earlier intervention. I didn't get any support until I reached crisis point. And looking back in hindsight, I wish I did get support when it first started because it took for me to take an overdose and end up in A&E to actually start to receive any form of support. Would you just be able to kind of briefly give me an idea about what has led to you looking for some, some counselling support? Waiting for mental health support can be fatal. A survey of almost 14,000 young people under 25 found that more than one in four tried to take their own life as a result of waiting for help. YCT, an Essex-based charity that was started to help young people before they get to crisis point, is seeing more demand than ever. We've got an 18-year-old and the safeguarding concern has been made because he is experiencing quite intensive suicidal thoughts. Serious conversations like these are becoming more common at YCT, who used to do a lot of early intervention work, but are now dealing with increasing numbers of complex and severe cases. We are seeing everything at all age groups. So this might range from self-harm, um, suicidal thoughts, suicidal intentions, and even, unfortunately, people who have made an attempt to take their own life, young people. Schools like this one in Hertfordshire are on the mental health front line. As NHS waiting lists grow and thresholds rise, they're stepping in to keep their students safe. And obviously with our new wellbeing ambassador programme where we're going to try and get more wellbeing ambassadors in the lower years. The school is offering therapy to at-need students and using a peer system to support pupils. Having that like, comfortable air around us is like, yeah, you can talk to us because we'll listen. It's easier to talk to someone who you see as a friend or an older sibling or just someone you trust, you know. That's what we are for so many people. 
I mean, especially with social media, because it's changed so quickly. A lot of teachers didn't have that when they were younger. So yeah. if you have a problem that relates to social media, they don't always understand it in the way that someone a few years older who's using Snapchat or Instagram in the same way as you would understand it. So you have all of the fallout from COVID, so an increased amount of eating disorders, an increased amount of anxiety and stress, suicidal ideation, things like that pre-COVID, we would have been able to probably send those off to an outside referral much more quickly. So we have to have interventions in school. It's just the realism of what's out there and, and the availability for the need, because the need has gone through the roof. In a statement, the government said, we're conducting a rapid review into mental health in patient settings. We're investing £2.3 billion of extra funding a year and transforming mental health services in England by March 2024. You want to go to the gym? Yes, please. As mental health support for young people buckles under the strain, it often falls to charities, schools, friends and family to provide support. Freya is looking to the future. I mean, I've definitely got a lot to thank you and Grandad for because you both always spoke up for me and you advocated for me yeah. and you told me to do the same. I consider myself very lucky that I have now made it out of that cycle and I didn't become institutionalised because so many people that I met in there are still in hospital today no one should be spending their lives in hospital. It's not a life in there, it's an existence. And if you've been affected by any of the issues in that report, go to channel4.com support to find a range of places to seek help.